The Six Invitation is finally here, but most viewers have noticed how incredibly defender-sided the current meta is, and it shows in the statistics. A total of a 61.1% defensive win rate as of time of recording, with maps like Skyscraper, Oregon, and Clubhouse having roughly 70% defensive win rate. This is a major increase from just three months ago at the Atlanta Major, where the defensive win rate was at 56.3%. Even last year's Six Invitational was only sat at 55% defensive win rate. And the current Six Invitational doesn't even measure up to the height of the utility meta at the Six Invitational 2021, which only had a 56% defensive win rate. So what factors have made this meta so incredibly defensive favoured in just the last three months. Stay tuned to find out. The first reason is Tuberal. And there are two reasons I say Tuberal. The first one being, if he's in play, how much time he can take away from the attackers. Just look at this round from DZ versus G2. DZ start to attempt to open the breach at roughly 2 minutes 10. Then purely because of Tuberal, it takes them 50 seconds to open the main breach. And that's purely because of the combination of Tuberal and an electrical operator like Cade or Bandit. You can throw the freeze canister on the opposite side to where the Cade Claw or Bandits are placed. And then the Bandits or Cade Claw will not be frozen. And so when the effect from the EMP wears off, the electricity reactivates and then zaps any hard breach on the wall. So you constantly have to remove your exothermic charge, like NGR does, and just wait out the freezes. The only counter to the two brow Cade combo is Maverick. But unfortunately, Maverick is also very, very slow. You have to Maverick the top of the wall, then you have to Maverick the bottom of the wall, all at the time, making sure that you're not being killed. People have to sit and hold the Maverick line so you, you don't get peaked, which takes manpower that could be used elsewhere to progress on the map. So essentially, the introduction of two brow into the meta just draws time from the attackers and DZ end up losing this round on time because Canadian has to stick the plant at 0-0 and Uno is able to kill him as he's getting off the diffuser. So it shows that that 50 seconds wasted by the two brow cage combo cost DZ. And reason number two is that if you decide to ban two brow, then you leave Azami, Fenrir, Solace, Valk, Cade, Mirror all open to be exploited against you. Well, if there were six good operators worthy of banning before the introduction of Tuberal, then why is it an issue now, I hear you ask? Well, it's quite simple. It's the combination of the Cade and the Tuberal. Before Tuberal's introduction, Cade really wasn't an issue. You could bring a Thatcher, you could bring an IQ and impact TMPs to find the Electric Claw and uh, impact TMP it. But because of the combination of Cade and Tubral making opening reinforcements so time consuming, even if you use a Maverick, attackers feel the need to ban one of Cade or Tubral so that combination isn't in play, so they save on time. And most teams would rather save on time and deal with Azami, Fenrir, Solace, Valk in the late round because they're able to, because they have a chance of winning the round through sheer gunfights. But if you're stalling out on time because of Cade and Tubral combo, by the end of the round, you've got no time left and there's no chance of winning the round. Before Tubral's introduction, each team would usually ban one of the four power operators of Azami, Fenrir, Solace, and Valk. So only two of them would be in play. But now one team is almost forced to ban Cade or Tubral, meaning three of the power defenders are open, in addition to a Cade or a Mirror. Third factor is the balance and changes that came with Operation Deep Freeze. And most notably, the changes to the frag grenades, removing the ability to cook the grenades. So you no longer can nade positions from below through soft floors. This was a powerful tool in the attacker's arsenal. But with it being removed, teams have had to find other ways to root out power positions on maps. We've seen some teams use Capital bullet holes from below. We've also seen teams tear up the floor with buck from below, so there's no safe place to sit. 
but neither the Capital Bowl or the bucking from below really lives up to its predecessor of the nading from below. The nades secured the kill. The Capital Bowl and the bucking from below are just there to move the player out of the position so you can potentially kill him with a gun or push him into an unfavorable gunfight. But because neither actually secure the kill, the effectiveness is a lot lower. So more defenders are alive in the late round. The fourth and final factor are the attacker nerfs that came just three weeks before the start of SI. First off, the ace Selma breaches increasing to four seconds detonation time from 3.2 seconds. This now means that you cannot double ace a wall and the bandit has only time to trick one side. Because of the increase in the fuse time to 4 seconds, Bandit can now successfully trick both walls in the time before either Selma will detonate. Thus meaning the attackers need to spend more resources and more time to deal with a Bandit. And they may have to forego the ace altogether to bring along a Maverick, which as we've already identified, slows the team down. And the other change is the G36 recall nerf to Ash and Yana. Simply, we just have very limited entry ops in this game anymore. Sledge got nerfed to a 1 speed, Zafir got nerfed to a 1 speed, Ash r 4 c got nerfed, ARX got nerfed. There just really aren't any good fragging attackers anymore. And maybe this is a direction from the devs to move away from the TDM meta, but at the highest level competitive, it really is hurting the best players. But as with any meta in Siege, every team is dealt the same cards. And there are some standout teams that have attack win rates over the 50% mark, like Sonics and G2 so far from the group stage. And after a big meta shift in Siege, the best teams to adapt will be the best teams at those tournaments. And two teams that have adapted extremely well to the meta so far are Sonics and G2. But both teams have a very different style of attacking. Let's start first off with G2. G2 don't necessarily play the utility game. They don't care about the non-essential walls. Look at their lineup right now. They have 12 stuns and they're facing a top red hold with a player in cash and all the crossfires from construction to be able to trade out that player in cash and red. Before the nade changes, most teams would go below into stock to try and get the vertical kill on the player inside of cash as cash is completely soft floor. But here, G2 drone out where the warden is. Okay, the warden is playing the top red stairs. We cannot flash him. So what do we do? We use the stuns to eliminate the other crossfires onto the warden and we brute force with the five players having incredible gun skill. Uno stuns over the top of the cash wall to stun the Cade. Virtue pushes in, secures the kill. And every G2 player is close enough to trade out on every position that Nip could have to crossfire. This round on Skyscraper shows another dynamic that G2 don't play into the setups of their opponents. In prep phase, Doki and Benja's drones get shot, gaining info on the office side of the map by two different operators, the Azami and the Mute. An Azami and Mute being over on the office side for a T defense signals to G2 that NIP are doing an office heavy extension. With mute jammers, his army barriers, they're there to waste time and deny the entry. What did G2 do? They understand their team setups. If they have a heavy office extension, they do not have the manpower to invest someone into restaurant or barbecue area below the bomb site. They set themselves up with their two entries opening up fake pressure on the office side of the map to keep those players extended onto office occupied. The VIP wall gets opened by Doki's hard breach and Benja ash charges the single soft wall on the office double wall. And the rotates then come instantly. Doki instantly rotates the restaurant window, jumps in. Benja instantly rotates to delivery door, walks in and walks towards main stairs. And then G2, they don't need to drone the positions because they know on the T side of the map, they have a 5v3 because there are two players occupied on the office side. And they use their utility to just brute force, yet again, all players able to trade one another. Virtue flashing from the black door to distract the Blackstairs player. 
He flashes the top of the door, Doki yings the bottom of the door, and he pushes in. At the same time, Alamal stuns into karaoke so that Doki cannot die from the karaoke verse. Benja walks up main stairs, and they just overwhelm, and because the silent map is a 5v3, G2 secure the trades no matter what, and they use their flashbang utility to facilitate that. Obviously, they've banned Fenrir. Obviously, they've banned Fenrir in this map, so they don't need to worry about clearing those FNAP mines. G2 play into the style that they want to play. They don't let the other operators dictate what happens to them. G2 always play themselves to the advantage. Sonics aren't as fast paced as G2, but they yet again have five incredibly strong players to be able to make this playstyle work. They understand the fundamentals of Falcons are roaming on Clubhouse Basement. That means there's going to be minimum two or three players off of the bomb site. Most likely two or three on the top floor, one on the or two on the middle floor, and one on bomb site. So they do a traditional kitchen dirt blue take, which means they take minimal map control, hence avoiding the setup of Falcons. If Falcons are roaming, they have obviously operators to roam with. They've got mute jammers set up, they have a solace, they've got a lesion for the traps, they have Cade to deny a hatch or a wall, and then they've got the Valk cams spread around the map. There's a lot to deal with for the attack. So what do Sonics do? They avoid the setup. They go dirt, which on a roam you won't be able to hold. They make vert without entering the building with ram through kitchen hall and kitchen. And then they've got the pushing power of the ying. Citizen takes nomad so he can minimally take Adam. Air jab off his flanks. And then Rexon takes garage so he can push blue through oil pit at any time with citizen. So they avoid the roam. They pressure site. And at any time they can overwhelm and flood the bomb site because they have the players and the utility to do so. They've got six stuns and a ying. And yet again, reading into the game in front of them, Falcons have banned Fenrir. This allows Rexon to just walk down all pit because Sonics have the players that can spot gaps and play make, and they have the gun skill to go with it. This round turns into a 3v3. Citizen gets shot at from lounge, knowing that there's only maximum two players on the bomb site, so he, he trusts his air jab to hold the lounge player's flank and pressures site with the rest of his team, able to trade out in the 3v2 on the bomb site. Doki on the last day of groups replied to someone saying that teams are using so many excuses just because they're fucking terrible. Don't blame the game, the best teams will adapt and learn constantly. And I somewhat agree with him. Yes, we have very powerful defenders. Yes, there are probably too many powerful defenders, but there are still a lot of tools on the attack that you can use and utilize to your advantage. Flashbangs are extremely, extremely strong when placed in the right position. You still have operators like Ying, Grim, Capital, which all are very low risk, high reward operators in rooting out those power positions and denying those crossfires. Monty, you can brute force with the shield people out of positions into uncomfortable gunfights. There's a lot of tools that the attack still has, and I think that teams haven't adapted in the short time before the Six Invitational. That is why we're seeing a very heavily defender-favoured meta. That's why we're seeing heavily defender-favoured games, because the majority of teams have not adapted how they're attacking. And the select few that have will be the ones that are successful by the end of the Six Invitational. Do you agree? Do you disagree with my point? Do you think we actually are in an incredibly defender favor meta? Or do you think the teams are just struggling to adapt? Let me know in the comments. Let me know who you think or you want to win the Six Invitational because I'm enjoying the game so far and I can't wait to see the main stage with the Brazilian crowd. It's going to be awesome. Thank you for watching. Sorry for the long time with no upload. Life has been busy, but Six Invitational is here. Siege is back. Let's enjoy it.